we want to welcome everybody tonight to our seventh national training session. We are so glad that you have joined us tonight. Uh, I'm Joe, and this is Lori Matthews. We're the National Directors of Care and Training. So uh, we look forward to a, a wonderful time tonight of learning and uh, hearing from our guest speaker. And we will uh, record this, and you can find on the uh, FICM.org website under Care and Training this recording in a few days, also the ones that we've done in the past. So we uh, welcome you to do that. So without further ado, uh, first, let me open in prayer, then mm -hmm. I'll have Lori introduce our guest tonight. Father God, we do thank you for this evening. We thank you that uh, folks have made time to come here and, and listen to learn more about what it's like working with church leaders and how to do that. We thank you for Allison and her willingness to prepare and present tonight. We just ask that the Holy Spirit direct our meeting, direct our words, and direct our questions. We love you, and we thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we are privileged to know Allison. Uh, we've, we've known you for, it's hard, it's a while. But Allison um, Fisher Cullen uh, became, she actually was, became a Christian in 1972. And she quickly discovered that her passion was for evangelism and missions. So that led her to serving with the Youth with a Mission in Asia and the South Pacific in the mid 80s. Um, more recently, she became a leader in village adoption mission in Senegal, West Africa. I'd love to talk to you about that. Uh, we, our daughter-in-law has uh, much the same passion in her heart. Early on, um, Allison became aware of many unexplained and very defeating struggles. And much like most of us, we don't have any idea where that comes from. And we all have different stories of how we have come uh, to know about freedom in Christ. And in her discovery with freedom in Christ and her, and through the study and materials she discussed and gaining her, her identity, understanding who she actually is in Christ, she became aware that it was the long years of uh, involvement in cult activity that led to many of the struggles and difficulties she was having. So through her freedom, her son and her husband both gained their freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. Professionally, she's an artist and a designer for the last 35 years. She's also served the community as a Young Life leader and a committee member. Young Life is a parachurch organization, which is a wonderful ministry to young people. I have a granddaughter who's in wildlife, which is <laughs> quite not there yet. Um, she has also served with us on our regional leadership team as a director of prayer for Freedom in Christ Ministry after she became a CFMA in 2016. Currently, she's on her church's prayer team and she helps them develop uh, discipleship strategies. She's also mentors college age uh, young women who come to her house every week and she uses the freedom in Christ, message and truth to help in that mentoring relationship. She's married to Jim and she has a wonderful son, Graham. So we're thrilled to have you with us, Allison. I can't wait to talk about working with church leaders. So thank you for being our speaker tonight. Gosh, thank you guys so much. I mean, truly, um, it's an honor to be invited in to do this and I really appreciate you guys and uh, you guys really are taking very good care of us in this ministry so um, I appreciate you guys so uh, yeah that's I'm like exhausted just listening to you introduce me <laughs> but um, I, I just wanted to say that tonight uh, we're going to look at the topic of working with church leaderships and I'd like to share with you 
a little bit of my journey, uh, what that's looked like in presenting the message of freedom in Christ with my church leadership, along with some key points that I've learned along the way that I think are really uh, very significant and have a lot of value to them. So these are kind of my lessons learned, if you will, and I've, I've kind of kind of whittled them down to to just 10, 10 of what I think, like my top 10 things that I have learned that I want to share with you guys tonight. So I'm going to kind of weave them in with my uh, testimony of what it's looked like to work with uh, my church leadership. And, and so my goal tonight is that you would come away with some best practices, as Lori likes to call it. So I guess I'll, I'll start my story with how I ended up at the church where my husband and I currently attend. So uh, about, I guess it's been about two and a half years ago, um, our pastor of a very small church plant that we were a part of was called to be the new president of Freedom in Christ Ministries. You might know this guy, his name is Dan Stewart. <laughs> and so, um, so, you know, we were very involved in the church plant that Dan came out of before becoming the, the president. He, were, he had been working um, on field staff part-time and part-time as our pastor. And so when he was called to be the president, obviously full-time job, we, our little tiny church plant that was steeped in freedom in Christ, as you can imagine, we really just could not afford to bring in a full-time pastor. And so the decision was made that um, we would just close the door and that we would trust that the Lord was going to send us each one of us where we needed to be. And, and frankly, to carry the message that we had been focused on for the previous four plus years. So of course, my husband and I made our little list of, you know, churches in the area that we wanted to, to check out. Um, and we literally just started at the top of our list, which was about eight miles down the road from our house, heading south into the country. Uh, really, it's very rural quickly. And, um, and there, in the, literally in the middle of a cornfield, is this, this church called Pompey Community Church. And that was our first stop. And uh, we were really uh, taken back. By what we found there. And I will just confess that our first Sunday there, as I looked across the congregation, uh, I really didn't feel like I fit in. It was a lot of people that I didn't think that I was really going to fit in with very well. And, and I remember having sort of this dialogue with the Lord, uh, you know, during the service as I was looking around going, yeah, I don't, I'm not feeling it. You know, this doesn't really, I don't think I'm going to fit in. And, um, and so clearly, the Lord said to me in that moment, yeah, well, this isn't about you. And these people need the message of freedom in Christ. And so uh, it really, really took me back. And I, I really got emotional. And I really felt like that was what God was saying very clearly. And even just during the worship service, I felt like he was giving me new eyes to see uh, these, these folks. And so uh, hopping in the car on the way home, I asked my husband, like, what do you think? And he's like, I loved it. This is great. I think we found our church. <laughs> and uh, we have been there ever since. So point number one, it's not about you. Whatever you're doing with your church leadership, whatever church you're in, um, it is not all about you. And a little bit later, uh, we'll talk about heart posture. But for me, that's when that really began for me, just a changing of my heart and really getting my heart under submission to God's will. So, so point number one is it's not about you. So my husband and I made a real uh, commitment, not only to attend the church, but to really dig in. We, we read their statement of faith and their vision for the church. Interestingly enough, the first week we were there, they had just finished compiling their statement of faith and their vision, and they passed it out. And that was like, this whole sermon was about going over their statement of faith and vision. So we were, we were thrilled. And we just really um, dug deep into that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of a church vision a little bit later. But then we, we put into practice, or, or, or I really did, even more so than, than my husband, but I really put into practice a very wise piece of advice that was given to me by my dear friend, 
Seth Broadhurst. You might know Seth, he's our national director of expansion. But he said at our um, a practicum a couple of years ago uh, on, on a pastor's panel, he was giving some advice and he said, take a year to truly understand the culture of your church. And I really, you know, I was brand spanking new at this new church and I just took that to heart. So point number two is understand the culture of your church and really give yourself some time to do that. That doesn't happen overnight. You're not gonna read a couple documents and you're there. So what does that mean actually? And how do you do that? So I would define church culture as the rhythms, priorities, and convictions of a congregate body. I'll say it again. I would define church culture as the rhythms, priorities, and convictions of a congregate body. So for example, I discovered that part of the rhythms of the church was to serve the immediate community, which is, uh, there's a lot of poverty in, in that area, um, by providing food. So they did this in multiple ways. In the back of the church, carved out of the cornfield, is actually like a victory garden. And they grew all kinds of vegetables that they would donate to the local food pantry. And because there were so many farmers in the church, they were also donating eggs and milk and dairy products and stuff to the food pantry, along with all kinds of other donations. They, uh, they did uh, these things called power packs, which they took a backpack and they filled it with food and um, that kids could take home from school for the weekends. They'd have enough to eat over the weekends. And they, they partnered with the local schools to do this. They also did monthly soup meals where they opened the doors of the church after the service and they served all kinds of homemade soup and bread and so forth, um, desserts. And the community just came in for a free meal. They did an annual chicken and biscuit dinner, which is, I guess it's legendary. I, I didn't know about it beforehand, but now I hear everybody talking about this and it's free. And everybody comes together to do this. So, so kind of the love language of the church is to feed the community. It's kind of, a, kind of their, their thing. Priorities. Uh, this would include their commitment to provide a faith-based preschool program for the community. Again, the church opens the doors to the community. They offer a preschool that is faith-based and it is at a you know, very reasonable rate so that people can afford to bring their children there. They also have multiple Bible study offerings, which leads to the next point, which would be convictions. This would include a really strong commitment to growth groups. The growth group is a big part of the overall church strategy. I've never, I've been in some big churches before. I've never seen a church that has 80 plus percent of the people involved in growth groups. And so they're, they're really, really encouraging people to be involved. That is where connection happens and discipleship and so forth. So I was really impressed with that. They also have a really strong connection to study the word of God. I realized in this church that there are Bible studies going on in the mornings and with early mornings for guys going to work, at midday for ladies that, who are at home, other groups that have young moms, evening groups, they're all, this is even aside from the growth groups, they have these Bible studies going on. So there's a real um, commitment there. And all of that, uh, to me, gave me a sense, along with other things, but those were really the things that gave me a sense of who these people were and what was the culture of this church. And so each church will have its own culture. And, um, and frankly, there's only one way to understand the culture of the church, and that is to jump in. So I participated in a growth group. I got involved in a Bible study. I, I did all of it and, and still do. And it was a great way to meet people and to really begin to understand things. The next thing that my husband and I did after about, about a year of being involved in the church is we became a member of the church. And so point number three, become a member of your church. Why is that so important? First, let me ask you this question. If you're not a member of your church, why not? When you become a member of your church, what you are saying to the leadership of your church is that I'm all in. And if you want to be powerfully used by God in your church, you're going to need to be all in. And committing to membership 
is a good pathway to do that. I really would encourage you to do that. I know that's in, in churches that I've been to in the past, they membership isn't like a big deal. They don't really talk about it that much or whatever, but it doesn't matter. Become a member. It's a, it's a commitment to a body of believers and watch how God honors that. Okay. So now we come to number four. And we're going to hang out on this one for a little bit because it can be a tough one. Number four is submit yourself to pastoral leadership. Yeah, so I know I just got some of you to twitch a little bit. And, uh, and the first thing that pops into your mind is, what exactly do you mean by that? And I mean literally and intentionally submitting to leadership. This is, this is a topic that I'm convinced is an absolute game changer. First of all, let me just say that for many of you who have been injured in your life by church leadership, I see you, okay? I personally know your pain, and I know that lump that just kind of formed in your throat. Um, it's a really, uh, it's a tough thing to think about particularly if you have gone through some, some rough waters in your church history. What I also know from personal experience is that freedom comes through forgiveness, right? We, we all know this in Freedom in Christ Ministries. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Therefore, do not be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Submission to spiritual authorities that God has instituted in your life is vital to your own spiritual growth. It's actually liberating. You know, I, I've worked with mentoring a few um, of our CFMAs, and this topic has come up over and over again. And it, it's, uh, it's a sticking point. And sometimes it's what stunts the growth of, of your CFM ministry in your, in your church, because it's just, uh, it's just a tough one to get past. If we consider, just for a moment, that the lack of submission has its roots in rebellion, it's easy to understand why it's so important to God. If we're having a hard time submitting ourselves to a physical person that we can see and hear and experience in the physical realm, how will we be able to submit ourselves to God who we cannot? And so taking this step really does impact our overall spiritual health. So, you know, step four in the Steps to Freedom in Christ says that it's an act of faith to trust God to work in our lives through leaders who are something less than perfect. But that is exactly what God is asking us to do. So back to my story for a minute. So what did this look like for me to place myself under the uh, spiritual authority of the leadership of my church? I really took this to heart because God just really laid it on me that I needed to do this. And, and I encourage you to do the same thing. So I called up my pastor um, with, with no other agenda other than to place myself under his spiritual, to say it to him. And uh, so, you know, I, I called him, left a message. He calls me back. And, you know, he's chitty chatting for a minute. And, you know, I had said to him in my message, you know, I have something I'd like to say to you. <laughs> and I'm sure he's thinking, oh, man, I'm going to get my critique of the Sunday sermon or whatever it's going to be. And, uh, and I said, so, so listen, um, his name is Wendell. I said, hey, hey Wendell, he, uh, here's what I want to say to you. And he goes, yeah. And I go, you know, I really believe that God has placed you in my life to be the spiritual head, spiritual leader for me and for, for my family, frankly. And I just want you to know that I fully submit to your leadership and that I place myself under you as my spiritual authority. And I'm telling you, there was dead silence for an uncomfortable period of time before he said, wow, wow. He said, you know, I've been a pastor almost 18 years. I have never had anyone say that to me. And he was choking up. And it changed the context of our relationship. 
it changed everything. And it changed me because I needed to be in that place of submission. And, and it was liberating. You know, I was trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to present Freedom in Christ Ministries? You know, I mean, he knew I was involved and so forth, but it, it just, uh, I didn't know where, how to really, you know, approach it or, you know, I was still trying to figure out the culture of the church and so on and so forth. So after that conversation, maybe a couple months later, I, I, I get a phone call asking if I would be part of a focus group of our church that was going to be discussing the meaning of discipleship and putting together a strategic plan for our church to fulfill the, our, our mission and vision to make disciples. And would I be a part of that? Heck yeah. <laughs> and of course, through that process, I uh, presented the Freedom in Christ Ministries. And it was a hit after our first initial meeting that I presented Freedom in Christ to the focus group. Then uh, I was asked if I would put together a two-year strategic plan for discipleship for our church and present it to the elder board and, and the pastors, which I did. And uh, <laughs> so just a little backstory. Prior to this, I had taken a sabbatical from my role as Northeast Regional Director of Prayer. Uh, I had gotten in uh, a little over my head, I think, taking on a lot of extra responsibilities. And I, frankly, I got burned out and, uh, and I just needed to take a sabbatical. And it was during that sabbatical that this opportunity came about. Had I not been on sabbatical and really listening to the Lord telling me, you know, literally the word he gave me was edit, <laughs> edit your life. You know, some people get a word for the year, like strength or, you know, courage or you know, faith, you know, whatever joy that people get words, for their word for the year. My word for the year was edit. <laughs> and, and so I, uh, I did just that. I decided to, to step away from that role. And when I did, God opened the door in my church for me to, to step up. So when I presented to the elders uh, and the pastors, they were just blown away and they, they, literally anointed my head with oil and commissioned me to lead out our church for a discipleship program. And that's very humbling for me to even, uh, you know, articulate it now, but it, it came out of that place of submitting. And I will tell you that every time I met with the elders or, or, or the pastors, or, you know, I would turn to them and say, I submit to your authority. I recognize that God has placed you in leadership in my life. And I submit to whatever you decide to do, whether it's freedom in Christ or not. There's lots of great discipleship resources out there. I just happen to be pretty well versed in freedom in Christ. So that would be like an easy one for me, but there's lots of good stuff. I'll leave it to you guys to decide. But I also want to say this, that, you know, I realize that for a lot of people, it's very difficult to submit, particularly if you're not in agreement, the doctrinal beliefs of your church. How do you submit to leadership then? And that, that's really a great question. Uh, I get asked it quite a bit. In fact, I was at the San Antonio practicum and uh, I had a woman come up to me after we had done a, like a question and answer pastor's panel kind of thing. And I talked about submission and, um, and this woman came up to me, very lovely, godly woman. And she said, hey, you know, I, I really get what you're saying, but I, I don't think I can submit to our church leadership. And she, and I said, well, you know, what, where's the rub? What, what's, what's going on? And she described to me what I would consider to be a real compromise on moral issues within the church. And so after she described this to me, I said, so why are you still there? why are you going to this church? Like, that's pretty sideways, you know? And she said, well, um, I get to teach a, a woman's Bible study group and, and they let me, you know, use the Freedom in Christ materials. So that's, that's really good. And also my unsaved husband likes going there. He feels very comfortable there. <laughs> and so we've been going for a long time and, and I keep going because my husband feels comfortable. And honestly, my advice to her was 
to take her husband to a church that preached the gospel and the truth where he would feel really uncomfortable. And maybe he, see if he doesn't get saved. <laughs> so there are times when things are really, really off kilter and, uh, and, and you should not submit to that. And, and you know when it's wrong. I mean, I think she knew she just needed somebody to, <laughs> to kind of tell her. <laughs> but, but that's really not always the case. Sometimes we have to really look back at those, what are the heart issues for why I think there's a rub? There's not something egregious like that, but there's something deep down that's just holding me back. So number five on my list is check your heart posture. So if you are struggling in this area of submission, I'm gonna tell you to take your heart to the mat and don't let it up until it taps out in full submission. <laughs> my, our, I shouldn't say my, our son, who's 21, is a third degree black belt in karate. You know, he's not into karate as a, you know, religious belief. He's a strong born again believer in Christ, praise the Lord. And most of his dojo is other believers, but it's a great discipline. And he does a lot of MMA. So anyways, I, I of course, I've watched this over the years. He's, he's been doing karate since he was four years old. And he, he comes in to help some of the, the MMA fighters practice. They practice against each other. And it, it's, it's, it's rough. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's rough. But he will take his opponent down to the mat. And he will put them in a very uncomfortable hold where they are squirming in pain. <laughs> And it is, he is relentless until they finally give up and surrender. And they will tap the mat to say, I, I give in, you win. That's what I suggest you do with your heart. That's what I mean when I say, take your heart to the mat and don't let it up until it taps out in full submission. <sighs> Gotta let that one just soak in for a minute. So, and getting back to my story, my church leadership decided to, uh, the first step in, um, in actualizing my, my two-year proposal of how to introduce Freedom in Christ as a discipleship ministry in our church, um, was to take uh, the pastors, elders, oversight council, and their spouses all through the Freedom in Christ course together. Of course, we're in the middle of COVID at this point, so we're doing it on Zoom and all of that. And, you know, it was all going along pretty well until it wasn't. And the battle began. The first thing that happened was that our worship director, who was best friends with our pastor, resigned. Uh, shortly thereafter, the administrative director for our church resigned. We replaced her. And in about two weeks after replacing her, the new replacement resigned. And it was rough waters for a while. It's a small church, a couple hundred people, not a big staff. Um, we had just brought on um, a new associate pastor, fresh out of college, uh, 28 years old, never have pastored before. <laughs> and his little head was spinning, I think, at that point. And then about halfway through the Freedom in Christ course, um, my pastor and his wife announced that they needed to take uh, a six week sabbatical, which they did. And when they came back, of course we were, we finished the Freedom in Christ course without them. Um, they announced that he was resigning <laughs> and, uh, and everything went on hold. Um, and we currently don't have a lead pastor. It's been very hard for our young associate pastor but God has really impressed on my heart to, to press in and really try to be as supportive as I can for him. But I, I'm, I'm getting ahead of my story, ahead of my story just a little bit. I, I want to jump back to, to lesson number six, which would be realize the importance of the church vision. Understanding that your church leadership has spent an inordinate amount of time before the Lord listening for this vision specific to your church. Don't underestimate it. In fact, know it well. 
in every meeting that I had building up to presenting the, this strategy, I always had a copy, actually a pretty well-worn copy of our church's vision statement. And, and I laid them next to each other and, and talked about how the strategy for discipleship would support and ultimately lead to the fulfillment of the vision for the church. And this really impressed the church leadership. This really um, validated all the work that they had done to see someone really recognizing it and pouring over it and thinking about how to actualize it. And it was a win because it was an actual demonstration of my submission, not only to them, but the vision that God had brought down for our church. So uh, again, number six is realizing the importance of the church vision. Okay, so we talked about the battle that ensued. Uh, and I, sh I should also say that, you know, I, I, uh, I started a, a, a little prayer team, uh, me and one other gal early on when Freedom in Christ stuff started to develop in the church. There was a, a friend that I had made who had heard about Freedom in Christ and was excited to hear about what that was going to look like for our church. And I said, well, you know, pump, pump the brakes. We're, we're not there yet, but would you be my prayer partner? And she said, absolutely. And so she and I started praying. And, um, and now that prayer team has grown substantially. But point number seven is get to know your pastor. Now, just for a hot minute, I'm going to, um, to plug a book, okay? And it's not a Freedom in Christ book, has not been vetted by Freedom in Christ, but it is well worth your time to read it. It is by uh, Jimmy Dodd and Larry um, Magnuson. It's called Pastors Are People Too. Um, what they won't tell you, but you need to know. Uh, this is a great, great book. Um, in fact, uh, all of the elders and oversight council in our church has just finished reading this. Uh, I think it may be a little bit too late, but I'm glad that they've read it. I'm going to just read you a quick excerpt from it. It says, every pastor needs a friend or an encourager. The pastor needs close friends who are 100% committed to providing encouragement through regular conversation, prayer, and unconditional support. Boy. It's so needed. Get to know your pastor as a person. What is his story? Where did he come from? Where did he go to school? What are his hobbies? How is he really doing? Never forget, your pastor needs God's grace just as much as you do. Are you okay with your pastor's flaws? Are you okay with your past, that your pastor is as messed up as you are? Are you okay with the fact that your pastor has doubts and unanswered questions? Let's be a people of grace when it comes to our pastors. One of the things that uh, through this whole process, painful process of uh, my pastor and his wife stepping away was that my husband and I really leaned in. We took him out to dinner. We checked in. We just listened. We didn't really say much. We just listened. We prayed a lot with them. Sometimes I see my, my pastor at, at church and just from across the room, and he would just mouth to me, thank you for praying. Thank you. Um, spent a lot of time with his wife over coffee, sometimes just sitting in my gazebo for a couple hours and just let her talk. We need to be there for these, these people. And, and for my new pastor, uh, our, our associate pastor, this young guy, I, I, I struggle not to be maternal with him because he reminds me a lot of my own son. But he's a dear soul, and I'm um, just trying to support him in any way I can. So, so be a Barnabas. Um, <laughs> you know, his name means son of encouragement, one of my favorite Bible characters. A really, truly great writer wrote this quote that says, look for the image of God in everyone you meet and seek to leave each person more alive than when you first met them. That's a quote from our dear friend, Rich Miller. And it's true, we, we really need to be there for our pastors in, in that life-giving way. Uh, number eight is let time be your friend. 
let time be your friend. So here I am, I'm in a holding pattern, one might say, in my church, but I'm realizing more and more each, as each day goes by, that God is in the timing. And my only job really is to just keep in step with him. Not racing ahead, not behind, just, you know, sharing that yoke and being in pace with what God is doing. It's not that he's not doing anything. It's not that it's stalled. It's not that it's halted. It's just a different pace. And, and in, that, in this time, I've been able to really pay attention to other things that he's handing to me in the meantime. Not the least of which is that during all this, the church reached out and asked if I would be the new prayer coordinator at our church. Of course, yeah. That's, that's my sweet spot. I can totally do that. And I'm growing this, um, this team and, and it's just been such a blessing in my life. And what I learned about that is guess what? That's God's priority. That's God's first priority, prayer. And so that leads me to number nine, which is pray like you mean it. <laughs> pray like you mean it. And like I said, I, I have a dear friend who's a one-on-one -on -one prayer partner. She's also on my prayer team. And we get on our knees and we have really covered our church in, in a lot of prayer, um, mostly for our leadership. We continue to pray for our pastor and his wife who have left and, uh, you know, for all the healing that needs to go on. And, and it's, it's a blessing. Okay, it leads me to number 10. Number 10 is suit up <laughs> suit up with your armor friends the battle is real and the battle is rough and that's because the stakes are really high but guess what we as you know are on the winning team and so really understanding uh which i know um most everyone in freedom in christ ministries is really understands uh has a greater understanding of spiritual warfare we can't shrink back from that. In my, my prayer team at church, a couple months ago, one of the older saints in, in the group, wonderful woman, very, very godly, she was praying and she said, you know, I, I, I'm just sensing that we're under spiritual attack and I, and I don't really know how to fight in this war. And I was like, you know what, sister, I do. <laughs> let, me, let me teach you how to put your armor on and how to fight back. And, uh, and so we are currently uh, studying some Freedom in Christ resources on spiritual warfare, um, liberating prayer being one of them. And she's learning a lot about how to fight back. So suit up. So that's it. That's what I have to present to you guys tonight. I hope that we have enough time. I think we have enough time to field some questions but I also want to offer myself to you, even one-on-one, -on -one. call me anytime, email me, whatever. We'll, uh, we'll talk it through. So thank you for your time and your attention. And I really appreciate it. Thank you, Allison. I, I loved your analogy about having your heart, uh, take your heart to the mat when you talked about Graham and how fiercely he wrestles. And oftentimes, we're right there. We can relate big time to that wrestling. Mm -hmm. Now, I would just, for my own benefit, I am a brand new CFMA. And I've got great plans for my church. Yes, you do. Great plans for my church. How do I get started? What do I, I mean, what are the nuts of, and bolts of what do I do to get, well, I, I don't want to say my foot in the door, but to get freedom in Christ into that house. Yeah. Well, you, you're going to start on your knees. Um, pray like you mean it. And, you know, I would just say, don't, don't be stagnant, but really ask God to present some opportunities for you. I know one of the first things we, we did when we uh, first started coming to our church, we wanted to get to know our pastor and his wife. We took him out to dinner. And I remember I, in the car on the way there, my husband said to me, 
listen, you know, I don't think we should talk about freedom in Christ. Let's just get to know them. Let's not talk about ministry stuff. Let's just listen, you know, all that stuff. I'm like, absolutely. A hundred percent. We sit down to dinner and after, you know, five minutes of small talk, my pastor turns to me, and goes, so Allison, tell me all about freedom in Christ ministries. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And, uh, so God opened that, that door, but it wouldn't be until more than a year later that I had an opportunity to really talk about it in, uh, in a greater sense. And, and again, it was, wasn't until after I'd really spent some time understanding the church culture. And then it gave me a, a better sense of how to present it in a way that um, was going to be effective for those who were, I was presenting to. So when I understood all the ways in which it could fit into what's already happening at the church, it was much more meaningful and well-received by the leadership. Yeah, you know, that goes in with point number eight, let time be your friend. So just yeah. let, let the Lord direct the timing and the steps to take. Yeah. So you, you would not suggest that I go to my church with my arms stacked high with every resource that Freedom in Christ has to offer. Yeah, well, I've tried that uh, actually in my old church. I literally had, I don't even remember, several books. I brought all these books to my pastor and I was like, yeah, this is the greatest thing in the whole world. If you just read these books, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And he was just like, what is going on here? I think he got through victory over the darkness and then, uh, you know, we, we had a conversation, but you know, no, don't, don't do that. You know, I know you're excited as new CFMAs and you're, you're jazzed up. You, you've been, you've been chopping at the bit, you know, for a while. Uh, and I love that. That's great. But yeah, let, let God set the pace. I just want to say thank you for sharing because you have very much encouraged me that there are churches out there that are really feeding people. And I know that my prayer right now is that my husband will be ready to find that because he's content in a church that is not seeking the Lord in a way that I think the Holy Spirit would honor. He's, our church is a little complacent. I'm ready for, I'm ready for something more. So my prayer is that God will move both of us in the direction he wants us to go but you're very encouraging that churches out there are it's a possibility so thank you for that yeah sure well and, and as you can as you can tell by the story it is by no means a perfect church you know even in churches that are you know dedicated to studying the word of god and small groups and all these wonderful things it's still messy um it, it just is it always has been, frankly. Let's look at the Old Testament. Here, excuse me, the, the new, the New Testament, the early church. For crying out loud, you know. Um, yes, I heard one of those sayings that stuck with me a long time ago. Is that if I found the perfect church and I joined, then it would no longer be the perfect church because <laughs> none of us is perfect. That's true. <laughs> so we talked about mission and vision and the culture of the church and the importance of really understanding that. And I've loved your descriptions and the definitions, but what if I'm not in, in agreement with this vision and mission of the church? Do I just kind of go start my own thing, my own CFM outside the church? Hmm. You know, that's really an excellent question because I do know some CFMAs have not been well received within their church. And so they've just kind of launched their own little side ministry. Oftentimes without the knowledge or the blessing of their church or church leadership. I don't recommend that. It's not what we teach in our university curriculum. You really need the church umbrella. It is not safe for you to be, you know, a maverick off on your own. And believe me, I, I have a lot of that maverick spirit in me. Uh, I had to take that to the mat, okay? And 
you know, we're going to go back to that, to that point of submission. If, if your church has not given you a blessing to develop a CFM inside your church, why would they give you a blessing to do it outside your church? I mean, they may say to you, we don't necessarily see that as being part of the mission of our church. But if you wanted to do that as a small group Bible study or something like that, you have our blessing. That's fine. That absolutely. And who knows, you know, what God will do with that. But if they give you a full stop and like, no, we're, you know, we're not on board, then, you know, you, you really, again, you get on your knees. <laughs> and if, if God is telling you that this is your church, then you stay there. And you know what? Live out your freedom. And that will become so attractional that you will see that God may just change the hearts of your pastors and your leadership when they see uh, what a free and fruitful disciple of Jesus Christ looks like up close and personal. I love the statement, live out your freedom. Mm -hmm. It's almost like the field of dreams, build it and they will come. <laughs> and I, I truly, truly Live believe it and they will come. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I mean, I, I do believe that. We talked about doctrinal beliefs that we don't agree with. And your conversation with the woman in San Antonio, godly woman, and her response to you was, well, my husband's not a believer and he's kind of comfortable there. And I love the way you just with grace said to you, to her, well, I suggest that you go to a church <laughs> that preaches the gospel that makes him uncomfortable. So that was, that was a really good response. Here's one too. What if I don't trust my church leadership because of past conflicts? How can I submit to them? Yeah. So this is. This is really tough. And um, so I'll, I'll, I'll share a little story. So I, I, I mentored a, a gal who was becoming a CFMA and that was her story. She had had past conflicts with her church leadership, her pastor. And you know I, I, it, it kind of came up when I took her through the steps to freedom in Christ. <laughs> it didn't kind of come up, it really came up. And um, she was stuck. And, and she had been doing some freedom in Christ classes and stuff outside, out from under the umbrella of her church leadership. So sort of that rogue um, maverick kind of stuff. And, and I really kind of called her out on that and said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't believe that's what God wants for you. You know, uh, first of all, let's, let's get down to business with forgiveness, which we did. And, and then I challenged her and I said, you know, I want to encourage you. I'm going to ask you to do something that you might think is impossible, but it's not because this is something God expects from us. And so if he expects this from us, it cannot be impossible or we're certainly not incapable, right? So I said, I'm going to ask you, encourage you to make an appointment and sit down with your pastor and place yourself under his submission. And to say to him, I recognize that God has placed you over my life and I am submitting to your leadership as, as my pastor. And God bless her, she did it. And again, stunned silence. And I, you know, it was a game changer. It, 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 it kind of, and, and not even so much for, for the church, the pastor, but for her, it was a game changer for her. And fast forward, I don't even know how, maybe a year or so later, God actually released her from that church, brought her into another church where she now has the ability to utilize her her freedom in christ material and resources and all she's a very talented teacher and and she's in her sweet spot 
even though she had been in that church for a long time without the blessings of her church and kind of doing it rogue and all this stuff, it wasn't until she learned that, that again, that, that heart posture of submission is just, it's vital. God blessed her. God truly blessed her. That's wonderful to hear. I'd really like to say thank you to everyone, but I also want to know if there are any other questions that anyone might like to ask. I don't know that I have a question, but so God's will for our life is our sanctification. And as we teach our students or anybody that we a disciple, we have to remember we're being discipled also. Yes. And if God chooses to use the building of a ministry <laughs> to sanctify us. <laughs> we have to remember that that's, you know, that's where we have to be. And, and it does make that path so much more enjoyable because don't we want to be in the center of God's will? And if it is a, if he chooses to use the building of a ministry to do that, and you basically have touched on that, you know, get down, you know, get your heart on the mat and, and do business with it. I mean, how many of us have really grown in our faith because of trying to build a ministry, right? We've come up against challenges, the, the stuff inside, the dross rises to the top because the heat got turned on, right? And we're being refined like gold. So I really like to encourage people that are building ministries to remember that part because, you know, we all want to go gung ho and, and get that ministry built because we have a message and people are going to benefit by it. And boy, if they just grab hold of it, won't they be, you know, you know, blessed by it. And of course we want all of that. But I mean, when I started to look at it that way, because, you know, have had a lot of bumps in the road and had had to um, look at how the Lord would use me in this ministry. So that just would be a closing comment that I would have. So really appreciate your uh, time here, Allison. It was great. Well, thank, thank you, you, Gail. Yeah. Yes, that was so well said. Uh, and it's so true that we are all in the sanctification process. That's God's goal for us. And yeah, diving into ministry We'll put you in the hot seat for sure. <laughs> right, 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 right. So. Thank you. Just want to thank Allison for mm -hmm. your presentation. A lot of work went into this and we appreciate it. But everybody that was on the call, we thank you for your participation. So uh, with that, uh, we'll bid you a fond good evening and we'll see you next time. I will let you know that next time we will be Sue Jantz, our National Director of Prayer will be sharing with us how to build a prayer team to actually, as you say, Allison, get on your knees mm -hmm. and to prepare the way for the Lord to do what he does the best, which is to free the captives. So we'll be seeing that on October 13th next month. Uh, with that, have a great evening and God bless. Mm -hmm.